Okay, so this week we've got an episode pairing Rarity and Rainbow Dash together in the spotlight, which is the first time that's happened since all the way back in Sonic Rainboom, I think. Oh, thank you, Rainbow Dash! You saved my life! Oh yeah, I did that too! Never mind, it's the first time. Which begs the question of how well these two can carry an episode together. Well, from a critic first and a fan second, here's the second opinion. Okay, so the first thing I'll say about this episode is that it's actually kind of a good thing that it takes place directly after the last Rarity episode, because at very least it's a little bit of a reassurance that Rarity's new boutique won't just go the way of Philomena the Phoenix, as they're already showing us that it's still a significant part of her life. Oh, Sassy Saddles, don't you just love my new feministique chic line of gowns? Sequins and sashes, Rarity, they're exquisite! And the second thing I'll say is that it wastes no time in making Rarity more interesting than she was in the last one. I modeled them after the adventures of Shadow Spade. Her stories are always full of mystery and suspense, and best of all, fabulous costumes! What are you doing? <laughs> oh, uh, just making some minor adjustments. Shadow Spade believes it all comes down to attention to detail, and so do I. Right there, and in less time, too. Showing us her interest in detective stories. That's something feasible, something specific. We can relate to that. It doesn't require big, long talks about what goes into making those dresses and what they mean to Rarity to give us a look at how she thinks and what makes her excited. She thinks they're sophisticated and snazzy, like her favorite detective. It's just an offhand snippet, but it makes her so much easier to latch onto. Much like... Whoa, this dress makes me feel like a princess. And this dress makes me feel like a princess! In fact, it even allows her to hold her own against my favorite character in the group this time around. Hey guys! <laughs> my bad. What are you doing in Candelot? I'm here for Princess Celestia's Royal Garden opening tomorrow. I heard that the Wonder Bolts will be kicking things off with an aerial display. And Rainbow Dash is here to fly with them. So exciting. Well, kind of exciting. Technically, I'm not flying. I'm just the lucky reserve who was called in to be the backup flyer in case a Wonder Bolt can't perform. And I do get to stay in the castle, hang out with the Wonder Bolts, and eat awesome food at the dinner tonight. Speaking of the dinner, you're still coming, right? Heavens, yes! A chance to dress up, be charming, and show off my newest feminist couture. Mm -hmm. oh. Oh. <laughs> Sorry about that. Let me help clean that up. Oh, no, no. It's almost impossible to get stains out of silk. Yeah, not only have Rarity and Rainbow Dash never really shared an episode before, their interests are almost polar opposites. And up until now, their relationship within the group compared to the others has been... Yeah, Rarity and Rainbow haven't been the closest pals within the group, but they also never really had a problem with each other. When we do see them interact, it rarely involves holding the other one in contempt. And when it does, it's usually in conflicts that include other characters too, and don't make the two of them seem particularly at odds. Otherwise, they pretty much just accept what the other one is and appreciate it from a distance. Rainbow appreciates the nice dresses Rarity makes her, Rarity appreciates Rainbow's tips on which Wonderbolt to bet on, and there's never really a problem. And granted, we know they're friends, but both have come into conflict with other members of the group, even sometimes the ones they seem closer to, over personal differences. I mean, did the writers just forget to have these two work it out at some point? Well, you might have guessed as much, but I actually think that in some ways they are each other's type of character. Not only are they two of the more ambitious members of the group, with clear goals and a proactive view on how to reach them, the ways in which they carry themselves because of that aren't a hundred miles removed either. For one, they're also two of the most vocal members of the group, especially when they're not happy with something. They each place a high value on certain qualities, and not only do they not always censor themselves, they can even be kinda smug. But at the same time, they're not malicious characters, and they even place a high value on the needs of others, in their own way. And again, they don't hate the idea of what the other one is interested in, they just wouldn't do it themselves, on a regular basis. So not only do they not have much of a reason to feel bothered by each other, they're actually able to talk openly and stay on the same page a lot better than some of the other members of the group, with an unspoken agreement on where their interests are different, and even a certain level of patience for one another. But we have yet to see how well it holds up when they have to spend some quality time together without the rest of the group, which makes this dinner party particularly interesting. Yeah, Juniper Phoenix is one of my favorite Stallion colognes. Mmm, mine as well. It's masculine and it's soft, with the barest hint of floral notes. Really? 
Don't you know who this is? It's Wind Rider! He's a living legend! And a perfect beginner level test for people who don't know how to spot the bad guy the second he appears on screen. Guess I'll just watch Wind Rider being awesome from the sidelines. Practice tomorrow is gonna be so boring. I don't suppose I could keep you company? You could! Okay, see that's another perfect little moment showing us rarity in action. It's not anything major, it doesn't take long, but it gets across that these two really do enjoy being around each other. And that Rarity really knows how to be a good friend to her. Much like this moment here. Spitfire's mom sent a message that she was sick. She had to leave to take care of her. In the meantime, we need you to fly in her place. I won't let you down, Soren! Ah! Oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh, oh my gosh! I'm gonna get to fly with Wind Rider and the Wonder Bolt because I'm the fastest and I'm awesome and they know it. Uh, oh. Rainbow Dash? <laughs> Let her have this, darling. Now, you might be wondering why I'm not focusing as much on the story where it turns out that the letter to Spitfire was a fake sent by G.I. Wonder and Rainbow is framed. But truth be told, there's not much to it. It's not hard to guess who did it and why, even without the hints they drop, and the investigation is written so that you have no way to know how Rarity is solving it until the payoff at the very end. So there's not much to get behind beyond the zaniness of the detective scenes themselves. But that's helped a lot by the clever decision to make it a noir parody right down to the visual style. We had a long road ahead of us, Rainbow Dash and I. Well, not too long because we didn't have much time, but the point is, I was up for the challenge. Rainbow Dash was obviously upset, but I had all my ducks in a row. Except one. But before you get too excited about that one, they really don't sink their teeth into it as much as they should have. Instead of really seeing how far they can push the silliness, the fun, and the visuals of the noir type stuff, you do start to get a sense of autopilot, even to the point where switching to black and white starts to seem obligatory. It is moderately funny most of the way through, with a couple visual gags that are pretty clever. Perhaps Take it from here. Plus, Rarity carries the show pretty well as a monologuing private eye with a dozen different outfit changes. Rainbow Dash was questioning my methods, but I knew what I was doing. Do you? Oh, oh, oh. Did I say that one out loud? But if you compare it to something like, say, Mystery on the Friendship Express, it's not hard to see that the energy and the enthusiasm could really be a lot higher. You might even find your interest waning before it's done. Otherwise, Rainbow's pretty good here as well, showing off a toned-down version of her usual brash, fun-loving impetuousness. She just might beat your record. Really now? Oh, I'm nowhere near as good as you. I mean, I'm fast, but I don't have the endurance to go long distances. How'd you like Wind Rider's spot in the show? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Oh, oh, yeah, oh, uh, yeah. Rainbow Dash? You could probably chalk it up both to character growth and the fact that she's in the presence of her idols. But anyway, she also demonstrates another reason that she and Rarity can get along better than Rarity and Applejack. Because Rainbow actually is concerned with how she comes across in a public setting. And she does at least notice when she makes a mess. Sorry I messed up your dress thingy. Also, like Rarity in the last one, this is technically where Rainbow achieves her dream. She finally gets to fly as one of the Wonderbolts. It was only a subplot, and for now it's only temporary, but for what it was, I think this episode did a lot better than the last one in its depiction of how this comes to pass and where it fits in with the big picture. It's only the very first step of Rainbow's dream, but it's a definite sign that there's more to come. And Rainbow gets to earn it by proving that she has more character than Wind Rider. Sometimes you gotta play dirty to be the best. The Crystal Mountains are too far for any pony to make it there and back before the Royal Garden opening. Rainbow Dash, we need you to fly in Spitfire's place. But Spitfire shouldn't have to miss this. I'm gonna get her! So while this one has its slow spots, all in all it's a good episode. And a small step up from Castle Sweet Castle for Joanna Lewis and Christine Sanko, who are starting to seem like a pretty solid addition to the writing team. It's not the most epic of wins, but against the last one, they did technically just outdo one of the show's best writers on my card. Jeez, first M.A. Larson, now Amy Keating Rogers. The veterans had better score a point back soon. If you enjoyed this video, please like and subscribe. If you didn't, I tell you I was framed. So if you'd like to watch another video in this series, click the link on the right. Otherwise, just check the description for more links, and I'll see you next time.